続きましてイリノイ大学アイスナーサテライトケネス・クリステンセン副所長よりご講演をいただきます本日のタイトルはカーボンダイオクサイドシークエストレーションリサーチフォーリスクアセスメントエンミティゲーションですそれではどうぞよろしくお願いいたしますアソシエイトレクタークリステンセン please Thank you very much and、uh, very honored to be here to talk to you today about、uh, some of the research activities、uh, that Eisner is focused on with respect to、uh, carbon dioxide sequestration,、uh, with a particular focus on the notion of risk assessment and mitigation. So,、uh, the motivation、uh, for this has obviously to do with the fact that continued energy reliance on fossil fuels is leading to ever growing. Carbon dioxide emissions, and one sees that here as a function of time, exponentially increasing, particularly here uh, in uh, the last few years. And even with the development of, of more green energy sources, these still、uh, embody a significant carbon footprint. And so, really, until truly carbon neutral energy sources are developed and implemented, reductions in carbon dioxide emissions can really. Uh, possibly be achieved through the notion of capture of CO2 and then sequestration. So, the concept of sequestration is, is rather simple. The notion is that、uh, there would be carbon capture at power plants and other、uh, sources of carbon dioxide emissions,、uh, and that carbon dioxide would be、uh, sequestered in、uh, geologic formations, either onshore formations, saline aquifers, Or within the sub seabed.、Okay. Um, there are a couple of, of challenges that, that one faces. One would obviously like to maximize、uh, injection of CO2 into these geologic formations.、Um, one would also like to simultaneously minimize、uh, carbon dioxide、uh, leakage risks. And really, this safety is, in this regard is of, of first and, and primary concern. And so,、uh, fundamental to all of these notions is really being able to predict the fate of carbon dioxide once it's been introduced into the geosphere. So, in Japan,、um, uh, courtesy here of Wright, there are a number of potential sequestration sites that have been identified.、Uh, some that are onshore and many that are、uh, offshore.、Um, some of these sequestration sites. Will rely on uh, structural uh, trapping of the carbon dioxide, so an impermeable barrier that does not allow migration.、Um, others will rely on other more sophisticated and, and less scientifically understood trapping mechanisms that I'll describe in a moment.、Uh, in total, it's estimated that about 146 million tons of, of CO2 could be stored in, in these、uh, potential sites. So, with that as background, we have many practical considerations that we have to uh, uh, think about with respect to moving from a basic scientific understanding of, of sequestration to practical impl implementation. So, widespread implementation of carbon dioxide sequestration requires obviously identification of safe and stable locations for geological storage of, of carbon dioxide. Uh, also relies upon the creation of methods for safely and efficiently introducing the carbon dioxide into the sequestration environment. Along with this comes the notion of development of what I'll term accurate prediction tools for long term fate of carbon dioxide given details of the local environment, so the geochemistry, seismicity, and any other factors that are relevant to the local geo geological environment. With all of that, we also need advances in technology that can both monitor as well as perhaps control the sequestered CO2. And finally,、uh, should there be leakage, we really need to understand the impact of the leakage of sequestered CO2 from the storage site, both onshore storage, which could leak back into the atmosphere, but also、uh, offshore storage from the sub seabed that could lead to leakage. Into the ocean and affect the local ecology. So, 
all of these considerations really sit at the nexus of both fundamental scientific understanding as well as uh, technology development. So with respect to scientific challenges of carbon dioxide sequestrations, to accomplish these goals, we really have to develop scientific understanding, tools, and technology that enable both design, analysis, as well as risk assessment of geologic carbon dioxide storage approaches. So Eisner uh, views itself as feeding the basic scientific understanding that underlie CCS technologies, and CCS technologies that will then be implemented in practice. And so Eisner's mission with respect to CCS uh, is that they wish to collaboratively develop techniques and instrumentation to monitor carbon dioxide storage in both onshore and subseabed reservoirs. We also want to understand the fundamental mechanisms of both short and long-term carbon dioxide fate in high-pressure porous rock carbon dioxide and water environments, and I'll describe this a bit more uh, in a few minutes. We also want to explore carbon dioxide dispersion and dissolution in the case of inadvertent release into the ocean from sub-seabed storage. And this is particularly of interest here in Japan, where if you recall from the map that I showed, many of the potential storage sites, sites are actually in the sub-seabed geology. And finally, we really want to advance our ability to accurately assess the risk of candidate storage sites and methodologies, as well as demonstrate viability through field experiments. So the selection of these storage sites really needs to be grounded in the basic scientific understanding of the carbon dioxide fate in that local environment. To do that, we need to understand the scientific details of the local environment, trapping of the CO2, and we need to have, for example, numerical predictions that can accurately predict the long-term fate of carbon dioxide. Really, a key to all of this success is collaboration and cooperation between industry, government, and academia. And I'm hoping to demonstrate our activities in this regard today in carbon dioxide sequestration. So Eisner's uh, Carbon Dioxide Sequestration and Storage Divi Division uh, has three main uh, focuses of, of research. First is, is in the development of technologies for CO2 monitoring as well as risk assessment of potential storage sites. And so this involves both field experiments as well as uh, model development. And as I'll show you in a few minutes, this involves collaborations around the world. A second focus area has to do with geological uh, sequestration of CO2. And here, we really would like to understand what are the mechanisms that will immobilize the CO2 in the geosphere. Yeah. So that over time, it effectively becomes permanently trapped. And this is something known as mineralization, and it's chemical reaction between the CO2 and the local rock environment. The time scale for that is over thousands of years. And so we need to immobilize the CO2 locally over that time period to really see this permanent trapping mechanism uh, succeed. The third pillar of our research focus has to do with ocean and carbon dioxide interactions. And again, this is, this is quite relevant here in Japan, where many of these storage sites are offshore. And so leakage will occur into the ocean and affect the local ecology. And all of these things come together in the culmination of what we hope to be uh, injection experiments. So as you see from uh, the list of, of researchers here, we have a nice integration of researchers based here in Japan that also interact with researchers that are based at the University of Illinois. OK, so let me give you a basic uh, sequestration timeline that kind of illustrates the scientific challenges that we're facing with respect to geological sequestration. So we start in year one, where we would inject, for example, supercritical CO2 into a geologic formation. The challenge here is that the CO2 in this state is often buoyant relative to the local pore fluid, which is brine. And we know that buoyant fluids will tend to rise. And so this means they're highly mobile. Well, over a period of 1,000 years, let's say, we hope to reach a point where the CO2 uh, undergoes effectively mineralization, becomes a carbonate, okay? And 
So this is a chemical reaction that is taking place with the local rock environment, but it requires local immobilization or trapping of the carbon dioxide for these reactions to complete. Okay. So over this time frame, we have several options for how this CO2 can be trapped. One is um, by capillary forces. So within the very small pore spaces of the rock, the CO2 becomes, lo the CO2 becomes locally trapped by capillary forces. Okay, so it's immobilized at a small scale. We also have, have hydrodynamic trapping, which is where there's a physical barrier that prevents the CO2 from migrating. Okay. Time scales there are in order of a year. One then has solution trapping, which is effectively where the CO2 becomes dissolved in the local salt water. And this is a precursor to the notion of mineralization, which has a time scale of about 1,000 years. Okay. So you can see the challenge in getting from initial injection to the notion of permanent trapping by mineralization. So here's another way to look at this. If we have, again, a local uh, saline aquifer, let's say, where CO2 is injected, then looking locally, we have the nexus of this supercritical CO2, the local salt water, and the microscale pores of the local geologic formations. And this is effectively a black box because we don't understand necessarily the chemical reactions that take place between the rock, the salt water, and the carbon dioxide. Okay. So we have several scientific challenges here. The first is understanding the physics of trapping mechanisms that enable mineralization. The second, and related to this, is understanding the physical and chemical alteration of rocks that contain supercritical carbon dioxide at high pressures. And along with these scientific challenges, we have the very important technological challenge of monitoring all of these processes within the geosphere to mitigate the impact of leakage. Okay, so now I'd like to describe to you a few of the research projects uh, based in Eisner that are meant to tackle some of these uh, uh, very fundamental scientific challenges that underlie practical use of CCS. So in my lab, we're focused on studying the trapping mechanisms in geological sequestration. Okay? So we already know that the CO2 has to be effectively trapped and that there's a three-phase problem of rock, solid phase, uh, and then two liquids, salt and supercritical CO2. Okay? The roadblock here is that the physics of this trapping is really not understood. And so if we want to build in that capability into a large-scale numerical simulation, that would simulate CO2 fate over kilometers of a uh, ge uh, geological site, we need to understand the local trapping mechanisms. Okay? So we do that, at least here first, using very simple pore structures, here modeled as cylinders. Okay? Within this, we can look at fluid motion, particularly carbon dioxide infiltrating into a porous structure, and come up with the flow patterns, how this carbon dioxide might migrate through these very small pore spaces, here on the order of 50 microns. Okay. This is just demonstrating capability. Where we'd like to go is pore structures that look more like rock. So for example, this sort of porous structure that is a, has a range of, of uh, pore scales. Okay. And these are the things that are being simulated numerically at Kyushu University to look at CO2 infil infiltration. And so where we're going with this is looking at high-pressure microfluidic systems that allow us to look at these trapping mechanisms. Uh, another research project ongoing at Kyushu, Professor Kitamura's group, is to look at infiltration into actual uh, um, core samples, here Teco sandstone. Okay. So in these experiments, Professor Kitamura uh, is using a high-pressure test rig to look at CO2 injection and trapping in these actual rock samples. And what we'd like to do is be able to relate measurements of elastic wave velocities to CO2 saturation. And this leads to the notion of monitoring the levels of CO2 contained in a geo geologic structure. Other work that's being uh, ongoing in Professor Kitamura's group has to do with the understanding the uh, behavior of supercritical CO2. So for example, Pro Professor Safrona showed this very nice image of a CO2 drop rising in salt water. Okay. This has direct application to understanding if leakage were to occur in a sub-seabed 
uh, storage site into the ocean, how the CO2 rises and interacts with the complex flow environment of the bottom boundary layer of the ocean. All of this can be fed into, for example, reservoir level simulations that could then predict uh, the behavior of the CO2 uh, within the reservoir. Um, with respect to monitoring, uh, Professor Suji's group is working on relationships between survey-derived data and carbon dioxide saturation, uh, saturation, again related to quantitative CCS monitoring. So if one can relate, for example, uh, elastic moduli and electric resistivity to the notion of CO2 saturation, then we can monitor with very high fidelity the levels of CO2 in the geosphere. And we can actually monitor then the migration of the CO2 over time, which is really a fun of fundamental importance if we're to both minimize and even prevent leakage into the atmosphere. Um, with respect to monitoring CO2 leakage in the subseabed, uh, Professor, Professor Shitashima's group, in, in coordination with uh, colleagues in the United Kingdom, are working on uh, autonomous unmanned vehicles uh, that can actually be deployed within the ocean environment to both detect and then map out uh, carbon dioxide leakage from the subseabed. And so the idea here is to use uh, pH sensors to actually map out in three dimensions uh, uh, carbon dioxide leakage and dispersion within the ocean. Um, again, back to the notion of the triple phase problem of porous rock, water, carbon dioxide interaction in geological reservoirs. Uh, Professor Shidoshima is working with uh, Professor Kitamura and F Professor Fujikawa uh, in Eisner to look at the notion of monitoring these chemical reactions within the geosphere. In this case, using an ion sensing nanolayer that would provide a measure of the chemical reactions that are going on at these very small scales. And the idea is that we can use this to build uh, technology that can predict CO2 fate on larger scales. Now, really at the heart of everything that Eisner is doing are collaborations with other institutes in a variety of different CCS projects. Okay? This is both in Japan as well as in the US and with other countries across the world. So I'd like to describe just a couple of these for you here. For example, uh, we have collaborations with Medien, uh, Japan CCS Corporation, uh, on the Tomokamai uh, CCS project, where uh, Japan CCS has carried out CO2 injection into the site. Eisner's role is uh, geophysical data analysis for the lithology classification. And the idea is that this information in an actual field experiment, okay, in complex rock structure, can be used to inform analysis for modeling of uh, both the geologic structure around the CO2 injection site, as well as concomitant prediction of the CO2 fate. Uh, we have collaborations with Wright on the Nagioka C, uh, CCS project, where here again, supercritical CO2 was injected in this case into an onshore uh, saline aquifer. And again, data that's derived from here will be used for modeling, particularly estimation of future carbon dioxide distribution. Uh, another uh, collaboration here with Jamstec, and this has to do with biological CCS. And the idea behind biological CCS is to convert injected CO2 in a local microbial environment to form methane. Okay. And so here, uh, the collaborative work that's going on are experiments using recovered core materials and geophysical exp exploration to reveal the coal bed distribution. And really what we hope to be able to do out of this is predict potential of, of biological CCS and really establishing a robust um, monitoring method for biological CCS. Uh, we also have collaborations with Kyoto University, uh, here particularly in the Indonesia uh, CCS project. And again, we're going through lithography characterization and also assisting them in determining uh, the drilling and injection sites. Um, 
There's also ongoing geophysical survey design, and really this is all based around the notion of future monitoring and modeling efforts. Um, Eisner also recently became a, a member of the Global CCS Institute. And so the Institute uh, really advocates for CCS as one of many options required to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Uh, it shares information from the international membership, and it builds capacity to ensure that CCS can be a widely used technology. So in particular, uh, the Institute's Japan Regional Office helps to facilitate cooperation among Japanese members, as well as with key stakeholders in CCS activities. And so the idea of, of, of participating in the Global CCS Institute is to link Eisner's research activities, not just with those within Japan, but those across the world, in sharing of information and a learning based on the knowledge that's gleaned at other uh, CCS activities across the world. So here in Japan, there are 42 members of which uh, Eisner is, is uh, a proud member as well. We also have collaborative partnerships in the United States. Okay, so for example, we have an ongoing collaboration and cooperation with the Illinois State Geological Survey, uh, the Midwest Geological Sequestration Consortium. Okay. The goal of this effort is to explore the, uh, the technical and economic feasibility of geological sequestration in central Illinois. This effort is, is led by Dr. Rob Finley, who is a member of Eisner's externally, External Advisory Board. And as a part of these activities, we've had both researcher exchange, so Japan CCS Corp and Eisner researchers have visited uh, the Midwest uh, Geological Sequestration Consortium on multiple occasions. And we also have a sharing of core samples in geochemistry with Eisner researchers. So Eisner researchers are actually testing uh, uh, core samples from the Illinois Basin within their experimental facilities at Eisner. Most recently, uh, my group in particular is forming a collaboration and cooperation with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, PNNL. Uh, at PNNL, there's a carbon sequestration initiative which combines both experiments and numerical simulations to study the physics of carbon dioxide sequestration. Okay. In particular, we're collaborating on both high-pressure experiments that are targeting the pore scale fluid mechanics of carbon dioxide infiltration and trapping. And so, uh, really, the key to these interactions, we're hoping, is that we'll be able to translate simplified laboratory and numerical work to the practical case of predicting carbon dioxide infiltration and trapping in complex rock structure, particularly at the high pressures that one sees in the geosphere. So in the last few minutes, uh, I'd like to just describe a bit of the focused research that my group is doing with respect to understanding trapping mechanisms at the small scales. So as I mentioned before, you have a porous medium. Here, let's take it to be the rock. And you have the nexus of a three-phase flow. You have a solid matrix. You have a fluid saturating the pore spaces, which is typically salt water. And then you have a fluid that's invading that pore space, which is the carbon dioxide. And as I mentioned before, there are four primary trapping mechanisms from hydrodynamic and capillary trapping, which have order one time scales, to really the permanent trapping mechanism of mineral trapping, okay, which is the geochemical binding to the solid phase. What we'd like to do is inform pore scale models. That is, available work on this problem is primarily numerical, and we'd like to validate these predictions experimentally. And really, that relies on quantitative measurements within complex pore spaces. So we build these, these two-dimensional, in this case, porous microfluidic test beds. You can see zoomed-in views here. We have pore structures then the, on the order of 300 microns and pore spaces, so that the, the spaces in between those structures where the fluid can migrate on the order of 10 to 50 microns. And so this shows a zoomed-in view here. What we do is we take these pore structures and we infiltrate them with a pore saturating fluid. Okay? So in this case, our, our analog for brine is glycerin and water. And we infiltrate that into the porous medium. And then what we do is we place this under a microscope and we dope uh, the pore invading or the, the pore saturating fluid with one fluorescent dye. And then what we do is we infiltrate this 
with a second fluid, which would be our supercritical CO2, let's say. And we dope that with a second dye. And by doing optical separation, we can actually watch the two phases migrate through the pore spaces and interact. Okay? And the idea is to try to understand a little bit better the fundamental physics of the pore trapping mechanisms for carbon dioxide. So here's a movie of this process. So we have a pore saturating fluid, and then we start to pump in a pore invading fluid. And you can see the pore invading fluid is dark, and what you find is that the pore saturating fluid becomes trapped inside the pore spaces. Okay? So for example, here and here. So here again, the movie's repeating. We invade with a pore invading fluid, and what you notice is that it does not uniformly fill the pore space. You end up with these regions of fluid that are trapped, residual. Okay? And you notice they, they remain fixed. So from this information, we can actually look at the population of the pore saturating phase and the pore invading phase. Okay? And so the colors here in the upper one show the pore saturating phase has been displaced by the pore invading phase, which now populates the pore spaces in this region. So what I'll show you now is essentially a time-lapse sequence of this invasion process. So here we have the pore invading fluid coming from the right. And what you see here is it begins to migrate through the pore structure. Okay? These black circles are the pore structures. And as we go in time, you notice that there's preferential infiltration pathways that this fluid is following. So it's not filling the entire pore structure, but it's mixing with the other fluid. And so you see over time, again, it starts to infiltrate other regions, but even then we don't have a, a homogeneous distribution of the pore invading fluid. So what this is telling us is that when CO2 is injected into complex rock structure, it does not uniformly distribute through the porous structure. Okay? It has preferential distribution. And so the challenge here is predicting these sorts of patterns in complex rock structures. So our next step will be to do these sorts of experiments in high pressure test environments where we can actually use liquid carbon dioxide and salt water and actually study the time dependent migration of supercritical CO2. We can then take that data and inform numerical predictions. So let me briefly summarize. Um, as I said before, the primary and unified focus of Eisner's CCS activities is really directed towards addressing the fundamental science that's underlying the technologies of CCS. Okay? So this includes developing techniques and instrumentation for monitoring carbon dioxide storage in both onshore and subseabed reservoirs, Understanding the fundamental mechanisms of both short and long-term CO2 fate in high-pressure porous rock CO2 water environments. And I just showed you some experiments that are meant to uh, uh, glean insight in that particular area. Uh, we also want to explore CO2 dispersion and dissolution in the case of inadvertent release into the ocean from subseabed storage. And we want to advance our ability to accurately assess the risk of candidate storage sites and methodologies, as well as demonstrate viability eventually through field experiments. And again, the take home message here is the key to success is collaboration and cooperation between industry, government, and academia. And this includes both within as well as between Japan and the United States. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have.